folks. Um, I am not where I thought I was going to be. I thought I was going to be back on my deck so we could have the lovely uh, insect sounds in the background. Um, but I sacrificed that tonight because we got a new webcam that I wanted to, to try out. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, I was playing around with the microphone settings again, um, but it looks like I'm getting a little uh, notice here that things are working. So um, you suddenly uh, realize that, okay, thanks, Greg. All right, well then I'm gonna try and focus on this camera as opposed to the uh, screen that's over here in front of me. We have all kinds of cool things to go over this evening. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, I'm gonna start our screen share with tonight's program. with tonight's program. <laughs> Oh. All right, well, now we've already hit a little glitch. What did I do? Well, uh, with that, folks, let's go ahead and, and get into um, the first topic of tonight, which if you know me, you know I love snakes. And um, it really didn't take too much prompting to uh, blow this up into a full column. Uh, I'd actually written about milk snakes uh, a few years ago, and I sort of combined the information uh, from that piece with uh, this latest email, which was from uh, a woman who described herself as living in rural China, Illinois. Uh, and when she wrote, she said that um, she was used to finding garter snakes in her yard, but uh, this snake that showed up was a new one. And as is so often the case, when a snake shows up and it's not the usual, uh, and you know our garters are just so widely recognized, uh, the, the dark, uh, whether it's blackish or greenish background with the prominent yellowish, goldish, yellow, uh, orangish stripe down um, the uh, dorsal surface down the back. Uh, when something other than that, um, people's minds uh, kind of go right into the red zone and they're thinking something dangerous, something venomous, uh, something um, to be maybe approached with caution. Well, um, I looked at, at the, uh, the photo that she sent and I got all excited because we hadn't um, um, talked about milk snakes uh, around this area for quite some time. As it turns out, not only did she, she saw this uh, milk snake in early, um, uh, let's see, that would have been in early, uh, early September, but then I heard from two other people. And as uh, I was reading her email and then I was talking to someone on the phone about it, I was reminded how the first time the snake uh, came across, um, my desk it was in the form of a phone call where I could have sworn the woman was saying milkshakes. <laughs> As she told me about uh, how she would found this milkshake on her driveway and she didn't know what to do with it. And I'm listening to this milkshake story thinking, ah, milkshake, is she really? No, she can't possibly be saying milkshake. She must be saying milk snake, uh-oh, okay. milkshake. Milk snakes. All right. Wow, that was really a long way to get to the point that milk snakes um, are not milkshakes, uh, but they nonetheless, milk snakes and milkshakes are two of my favorite things. So, anyway, um, looking at this snake, you might be thinking, okay, why do we say milk snake and not say fox snake? Uh, fox snakes are, are relatively common in this area. They're still not the usual you know, uh, garter snake, but they, um, they live along woodland edges. They're a snake that um, uh, they tend to, to be out more. They, they feed in the daytime. They are not um, a snake that is more uh, reclusive in its habit the way the milk snakes in our area are. Uh, where uh, 
Flaxnate might take some cover underneath a log. Uh, they might also decide they're going to be out basking or out foraging. The uh, um, milk snake, by contrast, they're um, what we would call fossorial in nature, which means they um, spend a lot of time uh, underneath the ground or uh, underneath uh, some sort of cover, uh, you know, whether it's a um, naturally occurring cover like uh, stones or rocks or a, um, maybe even a, a rodent burrow or uh, a cover board. Uh, we do place uh, triangles, uh, I'm sorry, rectangles or squares of plywood uh, out in the natural areas that we have here in St. Charles. We put them in semi-hidden locations so we can go out, lift them up and see what kind of uh, snakes might be uh, uh, living in that particular area. But well, anyway, we see uh, more fox snakes than we do milk snakes. Um, looking at this picture here, this is, uh, may he rest in peace, this is Frankie. He uh, was for many years our uh, education fox snake at Hickory Knolls. Um, fox snakes are what we would call a weakly keeled snake. If you look at the, the photo, you look at the scales along um, the back here, you can see just very faintly, there's a ridge or line, um, a raised line on the center of the scales that go down the middle of Frank's back, or of the fox snake's back. Um, <clears throat> and the markings are uh, blotchy. There's the blotches that go down the back and then there's blotches on the sides. Keep that view in mind, because now we're going to take a look at a milk snake. Uh, now, this is a, a photo, a, a Fish and Wildlife Service photo. This was, um, I believe, an Iowa milk snake. Milk snakes, the eastern milk snake actually has a lot of uh, individual variation uh, in color. Some are really bright um, reds and whites uh, and black. Others are much more subdued. This one it almost looks like a water snake. But um, if we look at the markings here, we see that it's a pretty consistent pattern all the way down the body of the snake. Um, each of the, uh, the brown markings on the back are outlined in black. That's another um, milk snake trait. You don't see that on the fox snakes. Um, and then uh, now this thing, I kind of wonder if maybe it was getting ready to shed. It's, it's overall, it's, it's kind of dark, um, more muted than I would expect from a milk snake. But as we look uh, down um, the dorsal surface of uh, the snake down the back, um, there's no ridge, there's no keel, there's no raised uh, line on any of the scales on the back. That's because uh, milk snakes are what we would call a smooth scaled snake. Um, the, the, the genus name for the snake is Lampropeltis. Milk snakes and king snakes belong to that same genus. Lampropeltis, lamp um, means shiny and pelt means skin, so shiny skin. These snakes really do have quite a, a glossy sheen to them. Um, and our, uh, if you are bold enough to go ahead and pick one up, you'll notice that they're also uh, quite smooth to the touch. Uh, if you uh, flip one over, you'll see that on the uh, milk snake, uh, remember in the past we've talked about anal plates, that's the, uh, the cloaca or the, my favorite term for reptile anatomy, the um, Swiss army knife of orifices, that's the, uh, the scale that's right before the tail starts at the end of the snake. Well, um, on the milk snake, that anal plate is entire or whole or single, one scale. Uh, on the fox snake, there's a, a slit or a division or a split on that scale. So if you have one in hand, you can check out that too. Uh, now, I, I mentioned you know, the, the coloring of this particular snake um, looks almost like a water snake. Um, I actually got a text. Uh, this is our friend James. James was in the KCCN, the King County Certified Naturalist Program a few years ago. 
And uh, he, after reading the column, um, he was reminded of when he got called by some co, uh, uh, some construction workers. Yeah, James worked for the, the city of Batavia and he was called over because there was uh, what they thought was a very aggressive uh, milk snake that was kind of impeding the progress of the workers. Well, James went in having no fear, although uh, taking some pretty good bites, he said. This, this was by far his worst uh, run in with the snake. Um, he said he, he got the milk snake out of the way and he sent me a photo and I, I looked at it and I thought, now, wait a minute, that is not a milk snake. That's actually a water snake. But when you look at those colors, when you look back at this individual, uh, there's a lot of similarity. So um, color might not be uh, the, the, the go-to thing that you wanna use for your identification. You wanna look at the, the type of scales, are there keels or not? Uh, and then also, this was a great photo to look at <clears throat> the uh, underside, the ventral side of the snake, the way James is holding it. And if we zoom in here, we can see the um, belly of most water snakes has this pattern that's described as being half moons or little fingernail type shapes. Um, and this individual, they almost look like triangles going down uh, the underside of the snake. Um, that's in um, pretty sharp contrast to what we see on our um, milk snakes. Their ventral pattern um, to me looks kind of like a checkerboard or in some individuals almost like uh, piano keys alternating uh, white and black uh, rectangles or squares. So um, <clears throat> pretty stark difference there as well. Um, now I always love it when um, the public responds. Uh, this was a, uh, an email I got after the uh, milk snake article ran. <clears throat> and uh, this woman, her name is Bev, she wrote that um, she pointed out that I did not address something that uh, has been uh, puzzling this woman for years. I'm a retired biology instructor and textbook examples of Batesian mimicry often include, in addition to classic monarchs and viceroys, milk snakes and coral snakes. Um, well, here's where we're talking about mimicry where there's um, one uh, type of uh, organism that maybe is uh, toxic or venomous and then it's got uh, another species that looks almost identical to it. There's usually like with the, uh, the viceroy and the monarch, the monarch is the, the one that um, has the glycosides or the toxins in its body and can make a predator ill, whereas the viceroy um, doesn't. It doesn't feed on milkweed. It doesn't build up those chemicals. Um, there's a whole other side to that where some monarchs are, have been shown to really not have a lot of that chemical built up in their bodies. We are not going to get into that right now, but um, the, the viceroy looks very similar to the monarch. It's a little bit smaller and it's got a, a dark bar uh, that uh, goes across the hind wings um, uh, on those, those viceroys. But anyway, monarchs and viceroys, milk snakes and coral snakes. Um, as this woman points out, she said that uh, coral snakes are tropical. Um, and so why would a milk snake in Illinois, why would there be, how would it even come about? They're separated by uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, now she does go ahead and say that one possible explanation is that they uh, evolved together and the milk snake was able to uh, disperse and go up into colder climates uh, while retaining its no longer functional morning coloration. That's where things get interesting because um, milk snakes, I mentioned they're in the genus Lampropeltis. All the milk snakes in uh, North and in Central America have the same, or until just a couple of years ago, they all had the same genus and species name. They were all Lampropeltis triangulum. Um, now there's been, since, you know, now that we have all this capability with um, uh, genetic um, analysis and, and uh, looking at DNA, uh, there's, uh, the taxonomists are just going nuts with um, it's splitting uh, these, uh, what we thought were all the same species into a whole bunch of different ones. Well, with um, milk snakes, they were already split um, beyond species into subspecies. Those uh, the 24 different 
types of milk snakes in North America and Central America were all at the subspecies level. So our Eastern milk snake that we have here in Illinois, that was Lampropeltis triangulum triangulum. Uh, what Bev was talking about in her email with the coral snake and milk snake mimicry, the, the best example of that is actually with Lampropeltis triangulum annulata, which is the Mexican uh, milk snake. Uh, look at these two. And you probably, um, you, you probably are familiar with the rhyme, whether you get it right every time or not. I know, I don't always say it the right way, but that rhyme, um, red against black is a friend of Jack and red against yellow can kill a fellow. If we look at these two snakes, um, quick glance, my goodness, they are awfully similar, but look at the order of the banding. On the left, we've got our coral snake, uh, venomous, uh, a very powerful neurotoxin. These are um, the snakes with the um, uh, retractable fangs, like, like our pit vipers are. This is a little uh, different sort of um, venom injection system that these guys have, but very powerful toxin um, in that venom. Um, but they, they don't, they've got a, a very narrow head, um, and so does our milk snake. Um, the um, uh, ranges of these two snakes are very similar. Uh, Texas coral snake is uh, southwestern Texas and in New Mexico. Um, some very similar range for our uh, Mexican milk snake. And um, I think this is a, a great example of um, a pair of species that did co evolve and um, our, the uh, milk snake is taking advantage of that mimicry. Now, um, milk snakes, uh, I mentioned they are part of that genus. Lampropeltis, which um, king snakes are also of that genus. Another really cool trait of this group of snakes is that they can feed on other snakes, uh, up to and including venomous species. So I kind of wonder if, in addition to using that warning coloration uh, or uh, co evolving that, uh, that similar banding pattern, if maybe the, uh, the Mexican milk snake also uses that to, um, you know, get close to maybe feed on some of these snakes as well. I don't know, but it's, um, as the, um, the milk snakes, you know, dispersed and, and spread out and, and went across North America, the patterns did start to uh, vary and blend. When we looked at those um, pictures of the Eastern milk snake uh, that was uh, in Iowa, I said it looked uh, kind of like a water snake. A lot of the ones that we see here in Illinois look uh, look similar to fox snakes. You have to really use those those traits I mentioned before, looking for the keels, uh, looking for the black around the pattern. So there's, um, I think there is something to that. Um, regardless of, uh, we're not going to do a real deep dive into mimicry tonight, but they are super cool snakes. Um, if you're very lucky, uh, I know. Um, most recently, the, the, the uh, milk snake I heard about most recently uh, was uh, right up on Crane Road here in St. Charles. They seem to be um, uh, in more rural areas. I don't know that we would necessarily see milk snakes in any of our uh, suburban neighborhoods. Um, I do know of a few neighborhoods in um, Geneva and Batavia where they are still seeing fox snakes. So anyway, keep that habitat requirement in mind. Uh, um, milk snakes do like to have a place where they can get down, get underneath, um, whether it's uh, rocks or logs, or even down into old rodent burrows where they can just kind of, kind of lay low. Anyway, that's uh, that's our look at uh, milk snakes, not milkshakes, although I want one of those. Anyway, let's move along. Um, Oh, I forgot, I put up a picture in, and this is uh, yet another example of the diversity within um, Lampropeltis triangulum, the species. This is another subspecies. This happens to be um, Oscar. This is a Pueblan milk snake who also lives at Hickory Knolls, um, triangulum cambolae. Um, th this would be a snake that wouldn't normally be found um, in Northern Illinois, but for the fact that they are often kept in the pet, uh, sold in the pet trade, kept as pets. Oscar came to live at Hickory Knolls when he was found um, actually in a, a garbage can. Uh, the 
uh, as the uh, garbage truck was was emptying the dumpster um, into the back of the truck, the operator looked and, and saw an aquarium slide in. Looking at the banded pattern of the snake, he thought it was a coral snake. So he called the uh, Geneva police. The Geneva police uh, went and took that uh, aquarium out to uh, Fox Valley Wildlife and they looked at the snake. Um, as I recall, they called it large and, and aggressive. Uh, they knew though that it wasn't a coral snake. Uh, long story short, he came to live at Hickory Knolls and because he came out of a garbage can, he named him Oscar. Anyway, but just a, another look at the diversity in this uh, really, really fascinating complex of 24 different subspecies of snakes, the milk snakes, not milkshakes. <laughs> Um, so let's go on now. Um, this, Mrs. Trisha, I have to thank you for, for this look. Um, and it's, I think it's a really excellent example of one of my favorite sayings, nature isn't random. Uh, so often when we find an animal out of place, um, happens all the time in the spring when uh, people are out and about and they see a turtle and, they, and it's not near water. It's walking across the street or a sidewalk or it's in a yard and they're like, oh my gosh, this turtle shouldn't be here. It should be in water. And then off the turtle goes. Um, and sometimes it's to the closest body of water. Other really well-meaning individuals sometimes will drive the turtle miles away to uh, you know, the Fox River or a forest preserve or something like that, where they're certain that it will then be out of harm's way. Well, the turtle didn't just randomly end up in the street or on the sidewalk. It had a very definite purpose, um, whether it was um, dispersing to a less crowded uh, area or um, in the case of females are often uh, walking around looking for a good place to lay their eggs. Well, in this case, um, uh, Trisha had been telling me about this, this toad at the school where she worked, and, and Trisha, feel free to jump in at any time if I'm not getting the story right, but uh, one of her uh, teachers at the school where she works said that he had rescued a toad. Now, well, here we have a look at um, the site where the toad was rescued from. In the, the close-up view, you can see there's some turf and some concrete. Um, if we um, back out just a little bit, um, here's on the right here, this is the playground surface and the curb and the turf. Well, that turf there is where, and you can see in the photo on the right, um, there's a sprinkler head there. And I guess there'd been some issues with tripping or, um, possible safety concerns or something. So um, the sprinkler head was, was covered with sod just to keep it, uh, keep everybody safe. Is that right, Trisha? Do I have that right? Yes. Uh, yep. So yeah, it, would, it would flood there and um, they couldn't, yeah, there was like a big divot. So they just put the sod over it. Okay. So, um, then you said that the other day your your uh, coworker comes up to you and and tells you that he saved a toad, right? That he uh, had noticed that there was a toad that was in peril, trapped underneath this um, uh, pressed rubber playground surface. Is that right? Well, he came to me to come out there because he knew where there was a toad, and he knew that I would pick it up. And he didn't want to pick it <laughs> up. <be> icky. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, you look at, at this, uh, these photos here, you see the, you know, turf grass, um, you see concrete, you see um, the, uh, the rubber surface, and none of this is really screaming amphibian habitat. And yet, when you pull back that playground surface and you look close, what do you see? You see a toad. Um, there he is. There he is. So, um, and the, this area underneath here, I mean, you can you can kind of see some moisture here. And I would imagine, um, I should. <laughs> you know, what, I will. Uh, I'll take over because it sounds like we have to mute there for a minute. <laughs> so uh, Trisha uh, teaches at a school in Kansas City, Missouri. 
and they have been having every bit as much of hot and dry weather as we've been having here in northern Illinois. So um, places that are dark and cool and moist are probably at a premium there, just as they are here. Well, this toad found this space underneath that rubber um, playground surface to be quite to its liking. And so it, it dug in and it, it stayed there. Uh, Trisha's coworker, I guess, caught a glimpse of the toad and thought, oh my goodness, this poor thing needs to be rescued. It's in a, it's in a terrible spot. It's by rubber and by, uh, by concrete, it's it's you know we need and to kids. yeah we, and kids too yeah for heaven's sakes <laughs> so um, let's rescue the toad let's move it somewhere so Tricia where and again your school is is pretty landlocked right there's no pond there's no um, you know it's it's pretty much surrounded by pavement isn't it correct yeah. If you go back to like the first picture, unless it's too hard to do, um, we have a connecting playground that has, um, if you look back behind that, up in the top right corner, there's a fence there. So we took it over to that area because it would be uh, less traffic and uh, thought that it would be safer over there. So we put it in a nice grassy area kind of on the other side of that playground. Mm. So I would say it was a good 50 to 100 feet away. Okay. Um, and what happened after you moved the toad to safety? Um, went out there the next morning and toad was back in his, in his same spot. <laughs> so we rescued it again. <laughs> You know, clearly the toad was sending you a message, and it's an important lesson for all of us. If you find an animal, it's not to say that bad stuff doesn't happen. If you know, if an animal uh, is injured or um, you know, it gets caught up in, in fishing line, or you know, there are some things that humans do to animals that cause it to be in terrible. But if you see a, a creature that that's um, you know returning to a spot time after time and um, it doesn't seem to be injured or sick in any way, chances are there's something there that that animal has found to its liking. Um, and in, in this case, Mr. Toad, um, he's found moisture, he's probably found food. I bet you in addition to uh, the toad finding the little microclimate there that it needs to keep its skin moist, I bet you there's a lot of, um, Arthropods, uh, whether it's insects um, or spiders, I bet they're also taking care, of, uh, taking advantage of that um, humid environment underneath the rubber mat. So cool story and something to remember. Nature, um, left to its own devices, nature isn't random. So thanks for those picks, Tricia. Appreciate it, and um, thanks for the details too. So. Um, <laughs> I had bald cypress on my mind this week, not because I was lucky enough to get down to Heron Pond, which is where this photo was taken. Um, boy, if you ever get a chance to get down to Southern Illinois though, uh, they, uh, Illinois, is, especially as we go farther South and we get into that unglaciated part, part of the state that's down um, towards the Southern tip, there are just all different kinds of um, biologically, different regions. And um, there's the area down near the tip that is um, very swampy. Uh, the bald cypress and uh, Tupelo swamps that are down there, um, they look almost prehistoric. Uh, yes, I love it down there. Uh, I go down there again in a heartbeat. Um, but I haven't been there in a long time. Where I have been is South Elgin. And um, I, I saw this stand of uh, bald cypress trees there. We have bald cypress trees planted by Riverview Mini Golf here in St. Charles. There's even um, bald cypress is one of the trees uh, listed in the Parkway Tree Replacement Program here in the city of St. Charles. Um, this is a tree that's been uh, cultivated and it brings a, a lot to the table. It is, uh, it is a conifer. 
picked, uh, you saw the uh, first slide there, it's a member of the redwood family. It produces um, a little cone-like um, fruit that contains its seeds. Uh, it's got needles um, for its, its leaves, but they're very soft and they're deciduous. So they turn colors very soon now on uh, these bald cypress. There's some over at Mount St. Mary's Park too. And bald cypress is gonna turn a, kind of a lovely gold color. Uh, and then those leaves, uh, needles are gonna drop off. It's, it's a cool tree. I love seeing it uh, progress through the seasons. Um, I love it that uh, it's a part of our suburban landscape here. And I'd like to challenge you to keep your eye out for uh, bald cypress trees in your own uh, wanderings. It's, it's something you, you know, you, uh, if your brain works like mine does and God help you if it does, but uh, if you see trees and they're kind of registering as you know, evergreen, conifer, uh, give it another look. Uh, it, it might be a spruce, it might be a fir, but it might also be a bald cypress. Very cool tree and a deciduous one to boot. Keep an eye open for them because they're going to be changing soon um, and they're just a, a delightful part of our landscape as we head into fall. That's it. Um, let's go on now. Let's, let's go off and go a muscling. Um, I saw these three guys plus one more uh, over at Fearson Creek Park. This was, uh, I guess, two weeks ago. And as it turns out, this uh, was a crew from the Urban Stream Research Center over in DuPage County at Blackwell Forest Preserve. Uh, you might remember several weeks ago, uh, we talked about the Rusty Rodeo. That's when, uh, gosh, over a hundred people came out to help, um, came out to Fearson Creek Park to help catch um, as many rusty crayfish as they could find. And as it turned out, we found, um, Gosh, I think it was over a thousand rusty crayfish. Rusty crayfish are uh, a North American species, uh, but they are not native to the uh, Fox River watershed or actually any watershed in Illinois. They come from the Ohio River drainage. Um, they're uh, invasive in this area and it was our goal to get rid of them as best we could. Well, as we're poking around uh, down the bottom of the stream, um, one of the young men that was there that day came up with uh, a live mussel. And as it turns out, it was a somewhat unusual species for this area and one that was um, being sought after for a propagation program. It is called uh, the fluted shell. So that was the target of the DuPage County team that came out uh, that day in early September. And I am happy to report that they were successful. So here's a look at uh, the fluted shell and it gets its name from, go figure, flutes on its shell, fluted as in waves. You can see here on the one end, um, there's a pattern of um, uh, flutes. I always think of pie crust when I see fluted shell, but again, I think of milkshakes when we're talking about milkshakes. So anyway, so you see this, this fluted uh, aspect to the, uh, the uh, anterior part of the shell. And um, looking at that, that's one giveaway, but there are some other species that can have sort of a wavy pattern like that. The real giveaway is to look at the other um, side or the, the back portion, the area of the shell that we uh, call the beak. There's a, a real distinctive uh, kind of double folded pattern here on the back that um, helps identify this, this dent here and these folds here identify this as the fluted shell. So uh, happily there were um, some gravid females that were found. Uh, these are going to be taken, they were taken to the Urban Stream Research Center and uh, they will be propagated. You might recall this was several months ago when we were talking about mussels and we talked about how they need a fish host in order to complete their life cycle. So the, the female, once um, she becomes gravid, she's got eggs inside of her developing um, offspring, I should say. Um, those are called glycidia. Uh, she needs to get those from her body into the body of a fish. Um, some species, some of our most unusual species, are very specific. Um, there's uh, 
type of muscle called the purple warty back. We don't really see those around here, but they are present in Illinois. Uh, I believe it's the walleye or the sauger. That's the only kind of fish that their glycidia can uh, raise the uh, parasitic on. The glycidia uh, attached to the fish's gills and um, um, kind of live off of the blood supply and develop using um, the, the nutrients they derive from the fish until they're large enough to fall off and live on their own. Well, anyway, uh, fluted shell, they have a little bit broader range of um, fish hosts. Um, Northern pike is one, um, bluegills, uh, largemouth bass. I think those species are uh, some that allow them, uh, the fluted shell to exist here in the Fox River watershed. Uh, the stretch of Fearson Creek, there were quite a few small uh, largemouth bass swimming around as well as a few bluegills. So um, let's hope that the uh, propagation effort is successful and we can help uh, increase the uh, fluted shells here in Kane County. Uh, the uh, mussels that were collected that day are going to be coming back here once uh, the propagation effort is over. They'll probably be put back in the water uh, in November. So right before things start to get super cold. Um, so as I was, uh, I was out there that day and watching the, the crew at work, um, I saw something else that caught my eye. Um, this picture here, uh, it's actually the, the start of a video. This, this is um, underneath the Route 31 bridge. So here's Pearson Creek. Uh, you can see the bridge up above. Um, let's watch what happens here. Um, this is one of my pet peeves. It, it turns out this is fishing line. I, at first, I was from a distance. I thought maybe it was you know, a heavy spider web, but no, it's fishing line. And look at this. I don't know if you can see up here through the right side of your screen. It's fishing line, and there's a fish. And I cry many people. What's wrong with people? Um, it took me a little bit of time because this this was a good. I don't know four or five feet off of the shoreline. And I was not wearing waders. Um, the muscle crew was, was still upstream. I didn't want to interrupt their important work. So I, um, amazingly enough, I was able to, to find a, a long stick and then snag that um, fishing line without um, myself falling in <laughs> or getting tangled up in it. Uh, I pulled it in and uh, took it back to my car and I looked at what was going on. And so it's a big old rat's nest of fishing line. And um, a, what would have been a potential host fish for the fluted shell, that's a, a little bluegill. Um, yeah, maybe it's a sunfish, a green sunfish. Anyway, um, look at how it's hooked. It's hooked um, through the, uh, just below the dorsal fin. I'm pretty sure that this fish was being used as bait for something larger and how it got thrown up over the um, uh, girder of the Route 31 bridge, I don't know. Um, I do know that in addition to the fishing line with the hook and the fish, I also picked up six beer cans. So maybe they had something to do with it. But anyway, I'm uh, glad to get this out of there because this is such a hazard, especially at this time of year. We've got a lot of birds migrating through this area and uh, they're you know, in unfamiliar territory to start with. And then you add in a uh, hazard that's hard to see, like clear fishing line, clear but very strong fishing line. Um, yeah, it's, if you can, um, if you find yourself walking, you know, along uh, whether it's a creek or a river, one of our local retention ponds, if you can you know, pick up any fishing line that you see, you'll be doing our waterfowl um, and our wading birds just a world of good. Um, this stuff is it can be not just hazardous; it can be deadly to those fish, uh, to those fish-eating birds. So anyway, it's a little PSA for today, and um, again, just you know. What's wrong with people? All right, let's um, let's take a look now at um, this was kind of a, a fun topic. I, I saw these flowers. This was gosh, this was on our walk several weeks ago over at uh, Bliss Woods uh, over in Sugar Grove. But I also saw 
these flowers growing in the natural area at Hat Green Knolls. We're actually beyond the flowering stage at this point. Um, we're into the fruiting stage of white baneberry, also known as doll's eyes. Um, it's uh, a species that has undergone uh, a name change recently. The, the scientific name uh, used to be Alba, and now it's Pachypoda, and I guess that refers to the thick roots of this plant. But um, you can see from the uh, shape and the color of the eye uh, of the fruit, you can see how it got its name, doll's eyes. And it's, there's uh, lots of um, folklore about this plant. There's some um, medicinal notes about the fruit, but every reference I came across emphasized the toxicity of the fruit as well. Um, it was sometimes used to help with the pain of childbirth. Um, it was another one of these plants that was supposed to also have uh, some just general curative powers, but it also sort of sounded like the sort of plant where you took it when pretty much everything, all, all your other options had been exhausted. Um, these days, you don't want to put it anywhere near your mouth because um, not only is it toxic, some people have reported actually getting blisters and things from the, uh, the stems. So it's a cool plant to look at, but it's definitely one of those look, but don't touch. But now this, this other common name that it has, doll's eyes, um, that dates back to um, when we had uh, these uh, China dolls and they had these really dark looking eyes. Um, I got a couple of Google images here and then I, I had a little fun and I added some uh, white baneberry or doll's eyes to one of these dolls here and it works. It works uh, pretty well, actually. So yeah, keep your eyes open if you're uh, walking through some local woods and you see some white berries, maybe 18 inches or so. Um, plant is, is fairly, maybe two feet tall, uh, but not uh, much taller than that. Uh, in rich woodlands is where you'll find this plant. Keep an eye out for it because it'll be keeping its eye out for you. Now, um, White baneberry does have uh, a cousin that also grows in this area. Um, it's called red baneberry. And uh, I was reading up uh, about this plant as well. And also uh, many references were emphasizing its toxicity. And then I, I came across, I just love when I, I dive down deep and I find something that's, um, that's quite old, but still weirdly relevant. Um, what I found was a publication of the New York, uh, I'm sorry, New England Botanical Club. Um, it, it's a journal called Rodora, which is kind of interesting because Susie and I, you know, we have a, a friend named Rodora. Well, um, <clears throat> this uh, is an, uh, an article called an experiment with the red, or the fruit of the red baneberry. Um, and this was a, a, a gardener um, out in uh, Vermont named Alice Bacon. Uh, this was in the March 1903 issue of uh, the Rodora. And um, she writes about how attractive the red berries of red baneberry are. And um, she says, the questions are often asked, um, where did you get these beautiful plants? What can they be? And are those berries good to eat? So um, she did uh, do some investigating and she said um, that in the fear that children attracted by the beauty of the fruit might eat to their own undoing, an experiment in the qualities of the berries was entered upon with the following result. So this woman actually decided that uh, since there wasn't a well-documented um, uh, evidence of the effect of uh, red baneberry, she was gonna take it upon herself to document that. So she starts off by taking a small dose after the midday meal as caution seemed advisable. Uh, the only effect noted was a slight burning in the stomach. The question, however, of children eating the forbidden fruit was definitely settled at once as no child youth, sane adult, not even a hungry schoolboy, would ever devour it from deliberate choice. The taste is most nauseous, 
bitter, puckery, indeed several even more drastic adjectives might be applied with perfect truth. Okay, so small dose after a midday meal, mm, slight effect. That wasn't enough though. She was determined to um, get uh, even more information, shall we say. She writes, having survived the first attempt, the experimenter hopefully tried again two days later, allowing time for the first dose to be completely eliminated from the system. On this occasion, double the first quantity was taken. Now she wasn't real specific before. She just said that she took um, uh, a small dose. So I don't know, maybe that was just a couple of berries, whatever it was, she doubled it. Um, and in less than half an hour, there was a decided quickening of the pulse and a return of the burning in the stomach, this time more severe than before. Those symptoms were transient lasting perhaps 15 minutes. Okay, so um, time marches on and two days later, the former, uh, twice the former amount was taken. So she's again doubled what she took before. Um, <laughs> this is where it gets really fun. Half an hour afterward, all curiosity on the subject of red baneberry was abundantly satisfied for this one experimenter, at least. At first, there was a most extraordinary pyrotechnic display of blue objects of all sizes and tints, circular with irregular edges. As one became interested in the spots, a heavy weight was lowered on the top of the head and remained there while sharp pains shot through the temples. Then suddenly the mind became confused and there was a total disability to recollect anything distinctly or to arrange ideas with any coherency. In an attempt to talk, wrong names were given to objects. And although at the same time, the mind knew mistakes were being made, the words seemed to utter themselves independently. For a few minutes, there was great dizziness, the body seeming to swing off into space while the blue spots changed to dancing sparks of fire. The lips and throat became parched and the latter somewhat constricted. Swallowing was rather difficult. There was intense burning in the stomach with gaseous eructations, followed by sharp colicky pains in the abdomen and also pain across the back over the kidneys. The pulse rose to 125, was irregular, wiry, intense. The heart fluttered most unpleasantly. These symptoms lasted about an hour and were followed by a feeling of great weariness. But in three hours from the time of taking the dose, the dose all seemed to be again normal. This experiment was carried on no further as the effects in the heart and the brain were danger signals not to be ignored. The conclusion reached is that while the very unpleasant taste will prevent it from being dangerous in general, the fruit of the red baneberry evidently contains a poison having a powerful effect on the circulation and brain. A dozen berries would probably be enough for a fatal dose, half that amount sufficing for the above experience. So let that be a lesson to you. Our bane berries, they are in bloom and they'll probably, uh, I'm sorry, they are in fruit right now and they will probably stay that way until we get into uh, later fall when those berries will drop down. Uh, again, look at them, enjoy them, take their pictures, but please uh, follow the advice of Alice E. Bacon uh, in her 1903 experiment, just leave them the heck alone. So um, with that, folks, we're gonna wind it up. Um, I have to apologize once again, I went to do my uh, experiment with um, the uh, fluorescing wasp nest and um, not only had the batteries gone um, dead in my black light, but one of them exploded. So I've got, it's in pieces. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to put my black light back together, if I'm gonna have to get another one. But anyway, we are once again going to put uh, wasp nests and fluorescents on hold, hopefully till just next week, but we'll have to see uh, how that little project comes back together. Uh, we all are so going to look at um, the topic of bees, and the things that they are blamed for and the other creatures that they are mistaken for. Um, got some more fun reader emails that just came in this afternoon. So we'll get those into a uh, readable form and who knows what else is gonna happen in the following week. So uh, with that, you know, um, 
I just had one more quick reminder. Uh, Susie, I got to thank you for this today. It seems like just a few weeks ago, we were celebrating some aspect of beer drinking and it's back again, it's National Drink Beer Day. So you can bet that once I leave um, Good Nature World Headquarters here and head back home, I will be celebrating this and I hope you do as well. With that, let's stop the share and I'll turn it over to you guys. Does anybody have questions? Any thoughts, any um, observations? Um, Wallace has a huge bald cypress in your side yard. Yeah, they are just the coolest looking trees. Um, and um, there's, uh, I don't know, I, I just think they're, they're a really uh, beautiful sort of a tree and something that I always associated with more uh, Southern climates and swamps, but they, they uh, really, um, and a nice aspect to uh, our landscape up here in the north. Um, it was well, always some springs over there in that part of my yard. So it's nice and wet over there, is it? I mean, it's a lot drier now. I think the water table has gone down, but um, I have had people comment on they think it's like the, the biggest one. And that's so cool. Well, you know, um, I have to see one. Yeah. Maybe we could take some measurements of it. Let me see. I could send you a picture. Yeah, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see that, Wallace. Thank you. Um, yeah, like Mount St. Mary's has a few. So um, one of the things bald cypress are noted for down in the, the swamp areas down south is uh, this, these growths that are referred to as knees. They're kind of a stabilizing structure that the cypress uses when it's growing in really wet ground. So it, it um, you know, roots might not serve to hold it in place as well, but the knees will kind of help to anchor the tree in place. We don't see the knees as often around here. I think the one over by mini golf has some, but it's, it's kind of wet over there. Um, but um, yeah, they're just, they're, they're a cool tree. And uh, if you can go down to Southern Illinois to see them, definitely take advantage of that. But if you can't make the trip right now and you want to see one, they are, um, dotted throughout our, um, our great Tri-Cities. Um, let's see, Kelly and Greg, um, uh, typically associated fox with the east and coyotes with the west side of St. Charles, um, but tonight saw uh, a coyote right before Good Natured over on the east side, cool. Um, oh, and Wallace yours has knees and like you said, it was in a wettish area. Um, the Arb used to have a nice collection of cypress with knees. So uh, lots of opportunities to check those out around here. Um, yeah, the, the coyotes, um, you know, they are um, kind of in that phase right now where the this year's young are almost the size of their parents. They've been growing ever since they were born um, around here that's usually in, in uh, March or April that the, uh, the, the pups are born. So they're, they're getting to be um, pretty good size. And um, I bet you um, we'll be seeing more of them and uh, the foxes too. Now mange is, uh, there's been some pretty severe cases of mange reported in both coyotes and foxes. So that's something else to, to keep an eye out for. The uh, Wildlife Rescue Group CARE K-A-R-E, um, Kane Area Rescue and Re or Rehabilitation and Education for Wildlife. Uh, they've been pretty um, proactive in trapping and treating these animals with mange. So if you see one and you see that it's sort of keeping the, the same patterns to its activity and it's found in an area, um, uh, let me know and we can, we can contact CARE and, uh, and maybe they can get a, a trap out there or they can life trap and then uh, rehabilitate those animals. Um, uh, big and healthy, that's good to know. I'm glad to hear, because yeah, when they've got mange, that's the last, they do not look big and they don't look healthy. In fact, mangy is often uh, an adjective used to describe coyotes. So I'm glad to hear that they're doing well. Um, and there was a question here about um, birds and animals, yes. Uh, this is one of those foods that um, birds um, are, I don't know how many 
species actually seek that plant out, but they do seem able to process it without having any ill effects, um, not like Alice Bacon anyway. And I certainly haven't documented it to the extent that she did. But yeah, it does serve as a, a food plant for some of our local wildlife. Um, yeah, let's hear for Alice Bacon. Huh? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, Lipple, you're right, Laura. Uh, I believe there are some uh, down there in Lipple. Those, those little pine cones, they're, they're almost round in shape. And um, they're, I guess, you wouldn't call them, they're, 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 the cones that they grow are, um, uh, yeah, they're, uh, what is that, about the size of a, a queen size owl, maybe, or uh, um, smaller than a ping pong ball. But yeah, keep your eyes open for them. Uh, they're out there part of our landscape. And so all, all of you, I really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, questions or um, notifications that they'd like to share with the group? If not, I really appreciate your time tonight and um, look forward to uh, seeing you again next week, Tuesday, 8 p.m. We'll have another round of good nature. Have a great rest of your week, everybody. Take care. Thanks Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Good night. Thank you. Chug a look. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs>